So, <clears throat> in this video I'm going to be demonstrating how I made my processor, and also many of the things that practically every processor is going to need, or something like it. And so, starting off, we have memory, and here I actually have two different branches of large memory, both derived from general memory. And so, the way memory works fundamentally is you have something that can hold a state without input, and that's, that's all it is in its most basic form, which isn't very useful unless it's packaged in some kind of uh, way you can manage it. So over here, this is yeah, technically a D flip flop. Well, how the, the way this works is you have your input here and the clock input here, and this is the output of of the state. And whenever the clock activates, it uh, imports the new state. And this is actually perfect for addressable registers and other types of memory. And over here, you have your stackoid memory, uh, which you can set it directly and then push it in either direction. And if you really wanted to, you could have more than two directions. You can have uh, three-dimensional stack memory, which would be like matrix memory, so that you could and push memory in any of the eight cardinal directions and in the in the larger forms here you can see registers they they don't have any one particular way that you know, to be implemented it's uh, more a matter of exactly what you're going to be using them for uh, if for this particular case this is uh, an 8-bit register with only a set function and this other one also has a clear function on top of that. And so these can both be used for different things. Now, essentially what a register is, is multiple of these, but all of their clock inputs are attached to the same input. And so they all activate in unison. And you can also chain these horizontally like this to make banks of registers which is one uh, one actual implementation short of being the full thing you would see in a processor. All this needs is addressing, which the only hard part about addressing is all the wiring and busing. Uh, over here, this is how you stack the stack memory. And so this input here uh, I believe pushes it that way in this case, and this other one pushes it the other way. And this is the data input, and the two data outputs here and here. And each one of these stores one of the states and can be read from or read uh, written to directly. And this can also actually be repurposed as something like queue memory or really anything you want. And this is what they look like stacked vertically into something more like that over there. And that's all of the basics of memory, especially for this model. The processor actually doesn't use stack memory, but it could. It's only a, a small implementation required. Over here, however, we have the, uh, the control flow and uh, all of the the different uh, signal handling and the signal generation. So most basically we have a monostable which receives any uh, type of uh, signal and only activates on the rising edge. And so every time it activates it releases the smallest signal possible and then returns to waiting for the next rising edge. And over here we have a clock. It feeds back into itself. 
It's actually this NOR gate that feeds back into itself, but it goes through a delay so that you can set the clock frequency. This AND gate right here is actually to control the NOR gate so that you can have it turn off and on. And when wired into a mono stable, you can have these one tick uh, signals at regular intervals, which is perfect for computer clock. And here we have uh, a decoder. And so the function of a decoder is to take an input and then uh, take an input in binary and then output it in unary. So for each combination in binary, there is exactly one output. And this can be used for uh, things like instruction decoding and routing. And over here, you have multiplexing. And so what multiplexing basically is, is a decoder that passes a data signal instead of just selecting an output. And so you can have the input be on and off, and the output uh, will correlate to that, but you can select which output. In this case, there are three outputs selectable based on the control signal. And over here is a sort of a optimized version of that. It's not actually a good idea to do it like this at all. And what this is basically made out of is transistors. So it's basically stating logically this signal and uh, any combination of this, but not any other combination specifically. And in unary, you can see this is the first option, and this is the sixth option, uh, meaning that in this particular uh, type of unary, only one bit can be on, but it can be one of any. And so the exact number of combinations has a correlating exact number of output bits. And over here you can see the optimized version of each of these in four-bit version. And so this is a decoder. Yeah, this is a demultiplexer, which actually does what this is. And this is a multiplexer, which does the exact opposite. It picks an input, and this picks an output. Over here we have uh, the, the functional things, combinatorics, or combinational logic. Yeah, uh, this is a full adder, and uh, this is the carry in, and these are the two normal in. And this is the optimized version, uh, the traditional version. Over here is the exact same thing, but using a decoder instead. And so it does the exact same thing, but it uses a decoder to do it. So each possible combination has a, a sort of ROM, something that's preset, as you can see here. This is the full 8-bit adder, but you can see there are some things added on to it. So here, each carry out is wired to every next carry in, but there's this thing here. And what that does is it XORs one of the two inputs and the output here. The purpose of this is uh, for subtraction. And how subtraction works is <coughs> actually... Yeah, just needed to check something really quickly. So subtraction, in this case, the not XORed input is what's being subtracted, and the XORed input is the normal. And the reason this works is because adding, or should I say, 
uh, inverting a number, uh, it's hard to describe. It sets it on the exact opposite end of this uh, this imaginary middle point, and then adding to that brings it f or pushes it further back, and then sub uh, inverting that results the subtracted uh, result. <laughs> it's such a terrible explanation. And this is a full ALU with these principles. It has one register here, and the rest of it is all just uh, functions, uh, such as logical and or XOR, not and arithmetic add and subtract, along with bit shifting left and right. Only it also has control flow for picking which one of these you want to apply at any time. And so it's actually a conglomeration of these three principles here. Beyond that over here we have you know, the sort of finite state automaton side of things, you know, the, uh, the control unit things you'll find. And so the way these things work is they have a state, and depending on that state and also the inputs, it will change its state to any of the possible number of states available. And so in this case, we have a sequencer. It has four states in this case, and it cycles between them regularly. And at the end of each state, it sends an output here. And so it actually technically has eight states and also a reset feature, because without that, well, it's not a very good sequencer. And it's just made up of a clock and a stack memory that feeds around, and a reset. And the reason to have something like this is, you, you usually want to do things in sequence in a control unit, such as the first part of the sequence being reading an instruction, and the second part being to read an argument to that instruction, and then the third uh, part of the sequence being executing that, and then you can have any arbitrary number of things after that, and it doesn't need to be perfectly linear either. Over here we have uh, the counter and uh, uncounter I made earlier, along with a decoder, which can easily be used as a program counter. As you can see, it counts through every possible state. And the purpose of this is, well, how are you going to address uh, the instructions without keeping track of where you're at? And it's also useful for other things like making arbitrary length sequencers that cut off at a determined point. Uh, but importantly, this one also has the ability to insert directly any value available and wipe. And this one, uh, this feature here, it decrements, so you can actually have it count down as well as up, which is a feature that I personally think is a great idea. But you can use both of these together in order to structure a sort of a automatic system for executing things in sequence, which is exactly how a control unit works. Over here we have most of the final products you would need to make an actual processor, uh, minus the ALU over there. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what in an ALU you need uh, to make it fully complete so that you can perform any operation. Uh, but I know that it's useful to have at least the things that I put in it. You can also put in a few extra features like multiplication and division if you want, but those things are uh, a lot harder to perform in hardware, uh, a lot easier to just do in software and call to as a function with pseudo instructions. Uh, but beyond that, here we have uh, the control components put together with registers, 
and this is actually the the nucleus of the control unit and so how it functions is to begin with it gets the first two instructions at the first two indexes here uh, actually the first instruction and the first argument it could be uh, implemented differently but this is how I decided to do it and then this uh, bit here executes that and then it just keeps doing that and so this is probably one of the simplest forms of the execution system and then these over here the decoded instructions can be wired to do anything in the system you want now uh, right here we have a sort of 8-bit transistor with one input and so you can see it only allows the flow through if this is on and that's very important for a data flow and control of data flow but here we have the actual register bank indexable or addressable even and so this is an integral component of the processor without memory yeah, it's uh, basically just a deterministic function system and not a finite state automaton anymore over here I have a demonstration for how this addressable memory works we have um, a demultiplexer here which basically uh, addresses with these bits here any of these along here and then writes with this bit here by activating the write mechanism and also the same thing here but this time with a multiplexer uh, each vertical bank of uh, D flip flops which is a register feeds into this correlating uh, row of inputs or column of inputs which is directed to here depending on the inputs and if you know how a multiplexer works I'm sure you can determine exactly how this system works here and then this here you have uh, the abstracted input referencing to all of these inputs which is a lot of wiring to do by hand and scrap mechanic but in the real world is a lot simpler to do uh, because busing is and not as strange as it is here in the real world or in a lot of other games might I add I think in Minecraft it might even be easier to do this well that's just generally how that works and from here you only need to do a small amount of wiring in order to actually have a full processor although I sincerely recommend using more than 16 registers in the register bank because 16 registers just doesn't feel like enough usually unless you have uh, a dedicated system for swapping registers with chunks in the cache at just outside the processor uh, but that's actually not simple to implement in most cases especially not here but that's everything uh, that I have to demonstrate for this portion.